say this, it doesn't matter to me what method you use as an actor, whether it's Stanislavski, whether or not it's Meisner, it makes absolutely no difference to me. What I need to see is you in the part. Welcome to Casting Actors Cast, insights for actors on acting in the business of show. Casting director Jeffrey Dreisbach takes you behind the scenes and reveals secrets to a successful acting career. You can find out more on the web at castingactorscast.com. Please enjoy, like, and share Casting Actors Cast. Now, here's your host, Jeffrey Dreisbach. Well, hello. <laughs> oh, that never gets too old, does it? And w welcome to another episode of Casting Actors Cast. I'm Jeffrey Dreisbach, Casting Director with McCorkle Casting. And it's so cool that you're here. Hope you're having a really, really good day so far. I know I am. This is kind of like part two of Audition Disasters. So we've already covered musical theater and we've already covered monologues. And now we're going to be jumping into Audition Disasters. The third section of our two-part podcast is Scene Disasters in Auditions. Disastrous Scene Moments. <laughs> your favorite disasters in a zine. And I am so happy that you're here. This is the moment of the podcast where I thank you so very, very much for listening. I'm getting quite a wonderful response from this uh, last episode of Audition Disasters. I'm going to continue the trend here with part two. But know that if you would like to leave me a message or ask a question, or is there something that you'd like to know about that I haven't covered yet, then please do me a great, great big favor. Go to castingactorscast.com, castingactorscast, all one word, dot com, and leave me a message. You can click on the form that says jump into the talent pool right on the website. And the cool thing is, is if you leave me a message, you'll automatically get a downloadable, if you want, downloadable PDF of conversation pieces out of the studio the voiceover workshop for professional actors. It's a 100 page book that I wrote a few years back. I think it's really f useful. If you've thought about jumping in and doing some voiceover work, I promise you, you won't be disappointed in this 100 page workshop workbook and it gives you a lot of uh, tips and exercises and all kinds of cool things there. That's all absolutely free. By the way, if you leave me your email address and your name, that stays with me. I don't sell it. I don't do anything with it. I just like knowing that there are people out there listening to the podcast. It makes me feel really, really good because what it really means for me is to give back what wasn't given to me when I started as an actor. I made a living as an actor for over 20 years, and now I'm in casting, and I can kind of share based on my experience both as an actor but also as a casting director in New York. So here we go, Audition Disasters Part 2. We're going to talk about scenes. And as you probably are aware, when you go in for an initial audition and there's a scene involved, you'll oftentimes have a reader, and the reader is there to help you look as good as possible. So a couple of disasters with readers. Actually, it's more like uh, actors with readers. <laughs> because I have seen actors literally react negatively to the reader that's in the room prior to anything being said. It's kind of bizarre. It's really important that you consider being as friendly and uh, as cooperative and think of it as a collaboration with your reader. The reader has been there and maybe has auditioned the scene many, many, many times that day. And you might not believe that the reader is really there to help you, even though that is the case. Sometimes the reader gets tired, like I said in the other podcast, is that we're all human. We're all prone to making mistakes. But if you've got a reader that's been doing this material all day long, then sometimes you can imagine it's only human that the reader might not be this incredible, enthusiastic participant in your scene. And so, therefore, it's really important, I think, that you make a choice and make a decision on how you want the scene to go and not to have a negative reaction with what the reader is giving you. Now, we take great pains at McCorkle Casting to make sure we bring in a professional reader who's going to really 
help you look your best. That's the objective anyway, because we want you to be great. We want you to be really sensational. So keep that in mind. And, you know, do yourself a favor, not that this is under the disaster category, but I think it's really swell that you thank the reader, you thank the accompanist when you leave, you thank those in the room who've just auditioned you. It just says a little more something about your personality and the kind of person you are. And you certainly want to leave us with the best first impression that you can. And that is, I think, work and play well with others. That really becomes an important thing. So now the actor comes into the room. Now, here's a disaster that's just unbelievable. We've had this uh, recently in a film that we were casting where the actress came into the room and she started talking about the character and she said very clearly, you know, I feel very strongly that this character is so strong and that she is just a survivor. This character survives everything that she does. And that's really important. Well, I uh, really, I, I couldn't really react to that at all. And the reason is, it just showed me that she had not read the script. She had had the script for over a week. And if she had read the script, she would realize that the character dies three quarters of the way through the film. So talking about what a survivor she is um, really spoke more to that actress's lack of preparation on the character. And so we didn't really necessarily need or want to see a strong survival woman. What we really needed to see is a woman who was struggling. And that kind of faux pas really made a blunder into something that, and um, I'll be frank, was just kind of almost laughable because the actress just simply didn't read the script. So the lesson in that is avoid audition disasters by doing your homework. Yeah, read the script if you've got, especially if you've had it a week in advance, if you've had no time with the material. Then without an apology, you say, I, I wish I had more time with this material, but I'd love to give it a go. Is so much better than, oh, I'm so sorry. I just haven't had time. My dog had a tummy ache and I had an ingrown toenail that I had to take care of. So I just haven't had time to read the script. Okay, maybe that was a little too much, the ingrown toenail thing. Dog with a tummy. I don't know. In any case, make sure that if you go in for an audition, it's a job interview. Every audition is a job interview where you're showing us, the casting people, how you are going to play the part. So please, please, please do yourself a favor. Do the homework. Read the script. It's going to give you so much more insight into the character that you're playing. Because why? I've said this a thousand times. Well, okay, not quite. I'm prone to exaggeration today. Not quite a thousand times, but at least a dozen times that information is power. Put yourself in a powerful, confident position by knowing as much as you can. Audition faux pas number two. Make sure that when you're working with a reader in a scene, and when I say we're using readers, I'm talking about initial auditions. Sometimes in callbacks, you'll be partnered with another actor, but I'm still on um, reading with a reader. It's really hilarious to me, and I kind of am not shaking a finger or really blaming the actor so much, but actors who've had a lot of training, especially at the university level, or have had just a, an overwhelming amount of classes for their own acting development, I think that's great. Here's the thing. I see this happening all the time, and that is that the actor ends up staring right at the reader without like moving their eyes away from the reader at all like a human being. What I mean by that is that the eye contact is so strong and so weird that it comes off as being too strong and too weird. It just comes off as being really not connected to the humanness of the character that you're playing. And I'm a big fan of the Meisner technique, but you know, Meisner is very concentrated and focused on observation. And the way that you do the observation is by literally looking at the other actor so much so that you've been trained now to simply stare at the other actor while you're acting. And that can become a disaster because immediately it looks like you're I don't know if this makes sense to you, but it seems like you're overly trained in Meisner technique. 
Again, I'm not faulting it. I'm just saying that when we want to see you in a scene, we want to see a human-to-human interaction within that scene. And so the technical thing of just simply staring, or better yet, invading somebody else's space by being so close to the other actor, it just looks, behaviorally, looks just really strange. Be careful about that. Remember that you want to place yourself in the moment, in the scene, as if it's a real situation happening in real time. So that's audition disaster number two. Make sure there's a human being behind those eyes and that you're relating to the other person as another person. It'll serve you really, really well. Audition disaster number three. I see this happening quite a bit. So the actor comes into the room and the casting director or the director say, do you have any questions? Let me just say that normally when that question is asked, welcome, nice to see you. Do you have any questions? That's not an opportunity for you to make something up on the spot just to show or feign interest. If there's something legitimate that you have a question about, by all means, you should ask it. I think if there's something within the script that isn't quite explained, we will oftentimes make that clear before you even open your mouth. We'll say, oh, yeah, by the way, in that scene, it's taking place in the subway. It's not taking place in a library. So people are playing it like it's in a library. Let's just play it like you're on the subway platform. You see what I'm saying? So that happens quite a bit. So if you are asked, do you have any questions? The better and stronger choice would be this to say, I don't, I'd like to give it a shot unless there's something you think I should know. Or is there anything that you would like to see? Boy, that's a strong response. In other words, I don't have any questions. I'm looking forward to showing you what I can do. But is there something that you would like to tell me about this? Now, that to me is an immediate positive way to make this a collaborative effort rather than you feeling like you're under some kind of weird spotlight with your audition. It also puts you in the right head of feeling as if you are in a working process rather than being put on the spotlight or being put under the microscope, which is oftentimes the complaint actors have when they audition. So, like I said in our last podcast, confidence equals competence. So, showing me that you're a competent actor means that you're confidently making the choices and decisions that you're making, and therefore, you will avoid those audition disasters. Audition disaster, I guess this is number three. I I kind of have lost count. I don't know. Yeah, I guess it's like number three. Um... Please, I alluded to this in the last podcast, and if you haven't listened to the last podcast, Audition Disasters, we talked about monologues and uh, musicals. Please do yourself a favor and do not ever apologize. Apologizing to me is like automatically making an excuse for the work, but it's also putting us other human beings in the room in an uncomfortable position where we have to say, oh, there's no reason to apologize. It's okay. Don't, no worries. No worries. It's all good. It's all good. But, so just avoid. <laughs> Did you like that impression? <laughs> just avoid apologizing for any reason. This is you. It's in the moment. You've done the work. You want to show me how you're going to play the part. Keep it simple. Keep it honest. Tell the truth. For God's sake, don't stare and don't apologize. You're going to feel so much better when you leave the room. That's another audition disaster is the actor who does a really good, credible job and then sort of does this weird psychological thing of apologizing as if to say, oh, I could be so much better than I just was. So please keep remembering that we're all human beings. We are on one side of the table trying to see if you fit into the parameters of what we're trying to look for. You have done your work and you're showing me the choices that you've made on how you're going to play this part. And that becomes a moment in time, period. It's not something that you should go home and stew about. 
I mean, I've mentioned this in a previous podcast is I can't tell you how many times I literally was in the elevator re-auditioning on the way home, <laughs> trying to figure out how I did by trying to recreate something that was literally not able to be recreated, recreatable, we recreated. You get my point. So my personal biggest audition disaster as an actor, I'll tell you. I was really, really excited to get an audition for the Broadway play A Few Good Men, directed by Don Scardino, written by Aaron Sorkin. And it was an exciting time for me to go and audition for Lieutenant Kendrick. And I was very, very nervous, as I often got before auditions. I had done my homework, and the audition, the preliminary audition, was uh, with the producers, the casting director, um, Don Scardino, and Aaron Sorkin, all in a theater auditioning the actors, various actors for various roles. And, of course, I was nervous, but I wanted to look my best, and I really worked on the speech, and it was just a single, like, monologue-type speech for Kendrick. So I go in and I'm, I'm nervous and I don't know about you, but when I get nervous, I have to go to the bathroom. I have this urge to urinate. And so <laughs> I went to the bathroom just before the audition as I, you know, usually do. Is this TMI? Anyway, I ended up going and walking down the long aisle of the theater and getting up on the stage and I did the work and Felt I did pretty good. I kind of lost myself in the role a little bit. So I thought, well, that's that was all right. That was all right. That was okay. I did okay. And suddenly I'm seeing Don Scardino in the middle of the theater. He stands up. And now he's working his way past Aaron into the aisle. Now he's walking down the aisle toward me. And I'm thinking, okay, this is either going to be something really bad or maybe it's something really good. I had no idea. And he comes up to me, and I walked downstage to the lip of the stage. And I leaned down and sort of squat down in a way because it was, a you know, the, the, because of the stage being about four or five feet higher. I squatted down to get close to Don. And he said in a very, very quiet tone, did you mean to have your zipper down during this? <laughs> I'm not kidding. My zipper was down. Now, it wouldn't be so bad if it didn't, like, I had dark slacks on and a white shirt and, you know, not really the best dressed for the audition, I guess. But there you could see the white shirt sticking out. Oh, my God. It was really uh, one of those moments that I just, how could I? And, of course, I just turned beat red. I said, oh, my God. And I stood up. I turned around with my back to the audience. I zip up the zipper, I turn back around, and he smiled because he totally believed that this wasn't some sort of weird actor thing <laughs> that I was trying to do to get attention. And he then said, that was fine, that was good, no worries, okay, thanks, bye. And so I left. It was like all I could do to keep from, um, I don't know, drinking a bottle of gin at that moment. <laughs> I was so embarrassed and was so humiliated. Imagine my surprise when I got the role. I did. I played Lieutenant Kendrick for over 500 performances on Broadway. I don't know exactly, I can't really explain exactly how that suddenly equated, but despite anything that could happen in the room, Clearly, he had the ability to see what I was capable of in the audition itself. And the fact that I had this other thing going on didn't make a negative impact on my work. Is there a moral to that story? <laughs> I don't think so. But I will tell you that despite these disasters, being focused doing your homework, feeling good about why you are an actor can only serve you. It cannot hurt you. External situations, other things can happen in an audition, but go with that flow. Be part of what that is about because 
the minute that you show angst and are upset is the minute you're showing a color that is not helpful to our process. That's the moral. Where has the time gone? Boy, I hope you've had <laughs> I've had a lot of fun sharing that story with you today. Please tune in next week, every Thursday at 1 p.m. I put out a new podcast, so I'd love to see you there. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you for letting me ramble on. I'm Jeffrey Dreisbach, and this is Casting Actors Cast. You've been listening to Casting Actors Cast with host Jeffrey Dreisbach. Find out more at castingactorscast.com, and let us know if you would like us to cover topics you're interested in. Thanks for listening. I'm Matthew DeSarno.